Hi, uh, welcome to Jewish Culture and Jewish Awareness. My name is Dustin Hausner. I'm the Jewish Outreach and Program Director at the Wayne YMCA. Our Jewish programming is funded through the Jewish Federation of Northern New Jersey. So today, if you um, can't tell, and also the timing of the video, this is in celebration of Hanukkah, uh, which is a very celebratory holiday. And I am interviewing someone who I'm really excited about because not only did he mastermind one of my favorite personal um, Hanukkah films that I watch every year, the last number of years, but his film that we're going to talk about is very creative. It's very interesting. It's unlike any Jewish film I've ever seen before. So without further ado, I want to introduce the director, the writer, and producer of the film, The Hebrew Hammer, uh, Jonathan Kesselman. Jonathan, so great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm doing good. Thank goodness. Everything is well. So I've been wanting to do an excuse to do this type of episode for a long time. And now it's, it's, you know, Hanukkah. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. You know, we, and it's actually just really good timing. Um, uh, just for anyone who doesn't know, um, cause I, you know, the film is rated R, so there is some uh, language and a little bit of violence. So I, I want to make that clear. No, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of language, a little bit of violence, <laughs> a lot of language. Uh, I was trying to be a little conservative, but yes. Uh, so <laughs> Um, I want to just say that from the get-go in case someone looks up the film title and goes, oh, we're going to watch this with the family, with the grandkids. And so I, I just want to be clear, this is a Ray R film, but it's a very interesting Jewish film. Um, I would love, actually, I'll, I'll let you, but can you explain to anyone who hasn't seen the film, what is The Hebrew Hammer? The Hebrew Hammer is a Jewish exploitation film. So basically, the film sort of takes the model of black exploitation films from the 70s, like Sweet Sweet Facts, Badass Song, or Shaft. And then um, it's really done with the Jewish twist. So the the protagonist is Mordecai Jefferson Carver, the Hebrew hammer, who is the baddest he decided to be. Um, and he is basically called into action when the evil son of Santa Claus, played by Eddie Dick, decides to eradicate Hanukkah and Kwanzaa, leaving Christmas as the only holiday around. And so the Hebrew hammer, with the help of his girlfriend Esther and with Muhammad Ali Paul Abdul Rahim from the Kwanzaa Liberation Front take on Santa Claus and try to save Hanukkah for all of us. I, I just love that description. It's completely accurate, but it's kind of one of those things, like if you're hearing that for the first time, you, you stop for a second and go, wait, what? It's, it's a very fascinating film. I'm going to um, pull up for a minute. I'm not going to show the trailer, but just um, I'm going to show the, the poster for the film. Um, so hopefully you can see it. Um, so we have the Hebrew hammer, part man, part street, 100% kosher. And you have this guy who's um, played by Adam Goldberg, who um, is kind of has this orthodox um, outfit, but kind of has that almost like a pimpish style. And as you said, it's kind of the um, very much a black exploitation film style, the music, the setting. Um, it's a very interesting film. So I'm going to take us out of that. Oh, well, you know, I, I, I have other taglines that didn't make it into the movie. Can, can I give you some taglines so that just that, that I wanted to use? So the, there's, that's one for the poster. There's, uh, he's, I said, he's not bad. He's Chabad, is one of them. Uh, we have uh, this Hanukkah, all he wants for Christmas or Santa's two point teeth. Um, and uh, just when he thought it was safe to go back to the synagogue. So there you go. <laughs> those are, oh, I love all those. So um, I want to ask, um, because obviously, again, this is a very interesting film, but this wasn't something that, th this spawned in a very interesting way. This came from... I think you did like a short film of this and originally you weren't actually in film school. There's an evolution of how this film got created. Can you kind of talk about how you got to the Hebrew Hammer? Sure, yeah. Um, so when I was in my mid twenties, I was 24, 25, I, uh, I wanted to go to film school and I applied to one place, which was USC. I didn't get in and so I was just distraught and out of anger, so I, was running, I was starting to write, learning how to write. I was working on a short film that never actually got written about two idiot film students, because at that point I was angry at film students, because I wasn't one, who have a war of attrition over a screenplay. But when you first saw one of the film students, he's talking, he's pitching his film called Maccabee Rising, which was a Jewish exploitation film. And the joke was in the class, everybody's like, but that doesn't make any sense. Jews aren't, you know, it was that kind of thing. So anyway, I get into film school eventually. And in my first semester, I do a short film called Subterfuge, which was um, a basic, basically a bunch of, uh, uh, agents, it's a spy film, we're passing around this package. The package turns out to be a porn film, but they're passing around this package. We don't know what the package is. And one of the agents starts out as an Orthodox Jew. And I shot in an airport when back in the day you could shoot in an airport without anybody caring. This is pre-9-11. And um, 
he goes in the bathroom, he rips off his clothes and becomes a black man. And the, the agent's name was the Hebrew Hammer. And he was a master of disguises. And the class went, you know, a uh, S-H-I-T over, uh, I didn't curse, I just spelled out the cursing or father now. Um, and, uh, and so I was like, wow, that's interesting. And then I thought about Jewish exploitation from the black Jewish thing. And I was like, I'm gonna look at black, at black exploitation films. So I got my hands on every black exploitation film I could get. And I started watching them and sort of just trying to understand how they worked. And, um, and how they worked was basically uh, African-American filmmakers at that time were not happy with their depiction in cinema. So they, they took all of the, the stereotypical stuff that was sort of seen in movies and they sort of said, well, if they're gonna paint us with this brush, we're gonna take those stereotypes, exaggerate them. But in the course of this movie, we're gonna win. We're gonna kill the white man and sleep with this woman. And we're gonna basically use our, you know, like if I'm, a, if you're gonna see me as an overly sexualized or aggressive black man, I'm gonna be the most overly sexualized, aggressive black man ever, and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna win. So I thought that was really interesting. And so I wrote the Hebrew Hammer, and um, yeah, so I did a short film, and that short film became really sort of this is pre-internet stuff. This is, I mean, I literally was on a VHS tape, went viral. Everybody would kind of wanted copies for their aunts, for their uncles and aunts and Jewish cousins, whatever, and. Uh, it also did well at USC, like the archivist there chose as one of my favorite shorts from 1950s to the present, which was an honor for me. And so I was like, wow, just this hitting a nerve, obviously. So I should probably write this. So over the course of the summer, I just started writing it and a tape was going around and got into the hands of a producer named Mark Platt, who was the guy who produced La La Land and uh, a bunch of other things, but, you know, a big Hollywood producer and it was very exciting. But he said to me, or not him directly, but I was sort of made it. It was intimated that I would not be able to direct it. So it was going to be like a black Jewish funny movie, Ben Stiller, Adam Sandler. And um, at the same time, another producer named Ed Preston, sort of an, an, an indie film legend. He did like everything from Conan the Barbarian to Wall Street to, you know, um, American Psycho. He called me his office and said, look, um, I hear you, know, you want to make this movie, you want to direct it. I'll give you a million dollar budget to make this movie. And so that was it. And then it was off and running. So... I'm curious when it comes to I, the cast, because you have actually a really interesting cast that work really well together. You have, you know, Adam Goldberg as the main lead. Um, you have uh, Judy Greer, who plays kind of the spy who becomes the, the girlfriend. You have Andy Dick, who plays an evil Santa, which on paper, that sounds so, but it works. It works really well in the film. You have Mary yes. and P P Pebbles. You have Peter um, Coyote. So... It, were, was it one of those cases where you were able to get the cast you wanted or did, was it something that kind of yeah all over yeah time? I mean it was like the script it was a good script I mean I'm, this is me being biased because I wrote it but it was like you know it was a very funny script and so you know Adam was the Hebrew Hammer is obviously the most important part of the movie it's, it's, you know, it's, it's carries the movie and Adam was on my list of top five Hebrew Hammers and we made a list and because uh, I, I remember asking people when I was in in graduate school, like who's the coolest Jew that you know? People in LA, and everybody kept saying Adam, Adam, Adam. He was at that point in Days and Fuse and you know Seven Five Orion, and uh, I was like, okay. And so, uh, randomly enough, he was in New York uh, pitching the production company, and I was financing my movie with one of his films. And they're like, that's cool, but you should read the script we're making this movie. And he read it, and his story is on the subway, or at least the story is now. I don't, I don't know whose story is anymore. He got to the line Shabbat Shalom. MFers, which is a, a um, again, I, I'm sort of abbreviating curse words because the black quotation is the vibe of the movie, which is very a lot of language in these movies. And he's like, I have to make this movie. And so we met in New York, and he was on. And then the rest of the cast, yeah, Judy, we cast. She, you know, she, I gave her, I think I gave her her first leading role in a movie, which is amazing. And she's gone on to become like a superstar. Um, Mario wanted him, and you know, and he he, he said, my dad would love to do this. His father traded black quotation. Father Melvin Van Peebles was the Writer, director, and star of Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song. So that was amazing. Peter Coyote, I didn't, you know, he kept calling the casting director saying, I want to come in and read for this. And a guy, his level will never read because he's too big a star. But in fact, he wanted to read. And I was like, okay. He flew down. He said, My name's actually Peter Cohen. I used to do like Yiddish theater. My wife, I read the script and I said, I'm like, I have to do this movie. She said, Go down there and tell these guys, go, go read for them. And he was going. And yeah. So yeah, the cast all kind of came together that way. So the film obviously makes a lot of fun of itself. And as you said, it's the Jewish version of black exploitation film. So like, just as a quick example, there's Jewish Justice League where it's literally their location is the Star of David. That's like the Pentagon. You have um, the group yeah. in the Kwanzaa Liber Liberation Front with the leader of Muhammad Ali Paula Abdul Rahim. Um, I think I said that right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the film is, clearly is, 
like it knows what it is. It doesn't pretend that it's something it isn't, which I think is really cool. And one of the things I thought was interesting was the character, the, the liberation from the leader, you made it such a kind of positive character and the idea that you made Kwanzaa as part of kind of the partnership in saving Christmas in the film, yeah. I thought was very interesting. And I'm curious now, uh, cause you obviously were sharing, you know, your, um, you know, research into black exploitation films. And obviously this film takes a lot from that, but was there a particular message of why you wanted to see them as partners? Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 I, when I was growing up, so I grew up in Los Angeles and it was, a, you know, being a, a, a being a white Jewish person, I was actually a minority, so I grew up with it was just a melting pot of everybody, you know. And um, I never understood, like I remember reading about all the the black Jewish beef that was happening in New York. There's all these, and I'm thinking to myself, these are both oppressed people. Like why, like why, you know, people don't like us because of who we are. Why are these people fighting? So it was kind of I made a concerted effort. I wanted the the black the black hero and the Jewish hero to be sort of brothers in arms, you know, taking on the white man. And I, that was sort of just yeah. Nice. Did you, I'm curious, did you take, um, obviously you mentioned black exploitation films, but did you take from other genres as well to yeah. help the film? So yeah. as a very quick, uh, yeah. no, no, go ahead, please. No, oh, okay, yeah. So, I mean, like you mentioned, uh, uh, the Jewish Justice League. So, a lot, you know, the movie wasn't just, I'm not spoofing black exploitation. It's, uh, it's I, I didn't take any, any particular film and just copy it. It was sort of like, wow, these movies work. But, you know, the idea was so ridiculous. I want to also kind of have a comic book vibe to it, so that like there's like that in you know, the Jewish Justice League is a nod to you know uh, the Hall of Justice. And but you know, I mean, just in terms of me, it was just uh, you know the kind of stuff that I was really influenced by as a kid was you know Mel Brooks' movies and Zachary Abrams. Like I love really really ridiculous but fast paced comedy where jokes are kind of flying at you twenty four seven. You know, just nonstop and different kinds of jokes and stuff where you'd have to sort of go back and watch it again where there's so much detail and layered stuff that you just, you know, I can still watch it and enjoy it. You know, this is 20, 20, 30 years after the fact or after 40 years after the fact, but yeah. So one thing, um, there's a lot of wonderful moments in your film, but one that was something that made me stop and think, and I think it's one of the reasons, and I would love to get your feedback on why I think the film has done the way it has and become kind of this cult classic is, there's a scene in the film where, um, I don't want to give too much away, but basically there's a scheme to get uh, Jewish children to celebrate Christmas. And, yeah. and um, basically the Hebrew hammer, what he tries to do to counter it is he pulls up the trunk of his car and you have the films Fiddler on the Roof, uh, Product the Chosen, and you have uh, Yentl. Yentl. And basically he gives them, um, I believe, Hotak the Chosen uh, to watch and he calls the chief of the Jewish Justice League and asks, you know, can you send me or can you play all the films with a strong Jewish protagonist. And of course he then says, Fiddler on the Roof, Yentl, right, and right, yeah. Chosen. But, but I love that scene and it made me think a lot because there, but for the exception of really like Holocaust films and certain other types of very specific Jewish films, there aren't a lot of openly Jewish protagonist characters. And I think yeah. it was one of those things like when you saw this Jewish Orthodox guy with the gold chains and the, you know, no business, there, there's, I think there's a great appeal to that. And I'm curious if, if that's something you've heard a lot about or if that was kind of- Yeah, yeah, I mean, you it was intentional too. I mean, growing up, I mean, there was no, you know, I, there wasn't a lot of, you know, Jewish heroes on, on screen that kind of bugged me. The only ones I can kind of remember were uh, Brendan Gleeson and School Ties and, you know, and, uh, but other, 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 other depictions of Jewish characters drove me nuts. I remember seeing Lethal Weapon 2 or 3 with Joe Pesci playing the, the Jewish accountant, just the most horrible stereotypical, like, and it just bugged me. And that was, you know, making a comment on the fact that there weren't a lot of Jewish heroes in movies. And so, you know, I got to make this movie. I'm going to basically block that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm also curious in regards to um, the film, because it, it, it came out on kind of a limited release into theaters. It also came out on Comedy Central was kind of the, where I think a lot of people saw it. So Discovered it, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, um, was it something that, you know, the hope was to try and make it a maze release? Was the intention to do it kind of in small theaters or when you... No, it, it was, it, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was a theatrical release. And so what happened was um, the, the financier, producer, Ed Pressman, and this other guy, John Schmidt, were very confident in film. You know, we were um, going to Sundance and it's a very funny film. And um, so basically they decided to try to sell it before the festival, which is a bad bad decision and I learned about it in hindsight because these festivals are hype machines it's all about you know so they showed it to all the buyers in LA and New York you know two screenings simultaneously and the buyers were 
older people, like there are older you know, people in their 60s. And that film wasn't for them at that moment. Uh, if that makes any sense, it's sort of a younger person film. And so what they all passed, Comedy Central saw it kind of sat around. We went to Sundance and we were like the hot comedy in Sundance. But at that point, all the people who could buy the film were, had already passed on it. And so Comedy Central laid it and then they bought it for a half million dollars. So we came out like, we had a small indie distributor put us out. It's actually uh, the, the premier gay art house cinema distributor put us out because um, uh, the, our initial our initial, our initial distributor went out of business prior to release. And uh, we were in age queens. We had a marketing budget of like five thousand dollars, you know. Like, so it, it, nobody saw it in theaters. But then Comedy Central decided to air it. Actually, they part their deal was wanted to air it. Uh, I think six or seven times before a theatrical release, which killed a theatrical, any theatrical release because people like I think a million people saw it on TV or something crazy like that. And so then, yeah. But you know, I mean, whatever. Movie finds this is you know probably this prior to Netflix. Back then, this was crazy. It was even on TV first, you know. But like now, it's sort of. Movies don't barely even exist in theaters anymore. So it was just, yeah. Do you have any, um, for you, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of particular scenes that you love. And, um, you know, is there any particular ones that you love that you have, like, as a favorite, like, any yeah. time you think of the movie, that's the scene you think of? Yeah. My, my favorite scene, personally, in the movie, I think is the funniest scene, is the talk to me scene. I mean, I can, I just, you know, I'm just watching the scene with audiences. I just, no matter who, where or who the audience is, because audiences are different. A scene will just kill, it just kills, it kills people because it just it builds and it builds and it's, uh, yeah. I just, I, and what's great about that scene was, you know, we were a very low budget movie, and so we had this amazing apartment we were shooting in, but they wanted us out by midnight, and we basically got to the point we were going to coverage, and I could only get like just you know, like one over the shoulder, and Adam went on Judy after like a wide master, and and they nailed it, like just I mean, literally just like stand one shot for like a minute, Adam's perfect. I don't have to cut at any point, and it's, yeah. I mean, well, I was gonna say your movie. I think this was made like less than thirty days. Like this was like a really twenty-two days. Yeah, twenty-two days, which is brutal. This yeah. last, this last, the last one I did was uh, eighteen days, and that's even more brutal. That's. I mean, but, yeah. Hats to you. That's incredible. So I, I just want to briefly mention uh, one more scene. Um, obviously, I've seen the movie uh, maybe once or twice. Um, but there's um, a scene that I particularly love that I think in encapsulates it all where he's at dinner with uh, his Jewish mother for Shabbat with uh, Judy Greer's character who's trying to recruit him uh, to um, you know save Hanukkah and it's mentioned you know uh, we want to recruit him because you know the fate of Hanukkah rests and she's and the Jewish mother's like Hanukkah Shmanukkah it's not even a high holiday and to yeah. me that, that's just a brilliant the, the Jewish humor is right the timing is right the it, it just like throughout the film, like obviously there's a number of things that, you know, are seen as kind of stereotypes, but, but you laugh with it, or at least that, yeah. like the people who I've seen who watch the film, you know, they always laugh with the Jewish jokes. Like they get why it's funny, you know? So yeah. it's a very powerful. Well, like that, 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 that character is my mom, just a little, a little bit enhanced, barely. I'm not kidding. My mom was very negative. Nothing ever did was good enough. You know, it's like, it's a very, it's a very Jewish thing. <laughs> no, I'm, yeah. Let me ask, this movie came out in uh, 2003, and as I mentioned, this is a movie that has quite a devote cult following, if I could put it that way, of people who just love the film Thanks. and watch it every year. Um, you had worked on or are working on a potential sequel to the film. I was wondering if you could yeah. talk a little bit about that and what's, you know, the story with it and where you're going with it and so forth. Yeah, so it's, uh, Adam and I have been talking about this and working on this for a long time now. It's the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler, and the script's done, and it's it's a much better script, and I'm a better writer than I was, and it's a much, it's more of like a, I'm, like I mentioned, I'm a big Mel Brooks fan, and I loved History of the World, but this is like History of the World, but with a story, and uh, yeah, it's a time travel movie with Hammer and Moe going back in time, chasing Hitler throughout time, and uh, in a time slicker, of course, um, and yeah, so, you know, We've had many false starts. It's gotten close a couple of times. We've had really big actors attached. At one point, we had Tracy Morgan is going to play Muhammad. Fred Armisen is going to play Hitler. Um, it's just uh, getting an independent film is finance is very difficult, especially one that's got Jewish themes. Or, but the film to me is not really. I would call it a Jewish movie. It's a mainstream movie, but just a, a very specific bent. Um, but maybe I'm crazy. Uh, yeah. So you know, I, we've. We've done some crowdfunding. We raised like 125, 175, something like that. We've been, you know, hired casting directors, and I got the rights back, which is amazing to both the sequel and the underlying property, so I can sell merchandise and talk about that. 
but you know, we still need, you know, initially it was a $4 million movie. Now I've rewritten it to be two and a half million, but you know, still need two and a half million dollars. So do you know any rich Jewish people in New Jersey who want to save Hanukkah this year? Bring them my way. I think that's the best plug I could have ever seen in a, but, but if anyone seriously wants to learn about the film and learn about the sequel, uh, please look it up. They obviously are trying to raise uh, funds for this potential sequel. Um, so Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler, which the name alone should, you know, make you very curious about the film. Um, but as you were mentioning merchandise and for those who haven't seen the film, there's a beautiful scene in the beginning where you have this beautiful music playing, you know, this kind of um, the shaft and you see on the top area, for those who are in New York, you know it very well. And it says the hood on it. And I, I think I pronounced it correctly, the hood. So if we can see, yes. look at that beautiful. This is the hood and this, this is the, 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 the subway lines are J-E-W-R real subway lines. And uh, so yeah, so the, the merchandise, I can, I can sell merchandise, which is, I feel like I've now become officially fully Jewish. Mm. Uh, okay. Uh, you can get the merchandise. Hold on, let me show you that. It's hebrewhammer.threadless.com. Hebrewhammer.threadless.com. There's some really cool stuff. Operators are standing by. So, Tell a friend, buy stuff for Hanukkah, you make great gifts. Well, I was going to say, you have uh, that shirt you are selling, um, things I can mention, because again, there is some uh, vulgar, some language that are more adult oriented, I'll put it that way. But, you know, you have a poster um, that's um, the Hebrew Hammer versus Hitler, which is kind of a nice parody of the classic Captain America punching Hitler um, that you're selling. You're having the logo t-shirts. Um, you're doing a mask that says a Sheket Bavaka Shah on it. Which I'm personally eyeing. Um, it's a great Elion, right? Elion, Supreme, yeah, Supreme shirt sure, in Hebrew. Yeah. A lot of really fun gifts for um, obviously your more teenage and adult oriented uh, people, or even you know just someone who's very sophisticated and likes that humor. So um, we'll make sure to put the link on the bottom of the video. So uh, we'll have G dash bless you. G dash bless you, Justin Hasler. <laughs> and um, also very importantly, because I had this trouble. Um, if anyone wants to rent your movie, like to watch it now for Hanukkah, I believe it's on Venmo, if I'm not, if I'm mistaken. If Vimeo, I'm Vimeo, Vimeo, yeah. And you can watch it uh, at Vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Hebrew Hammer. Vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Hebrew Hammer. We'll do it a third time for all the people at home. Vimeo.com slash on demand slash the Hebrew Hammer. And you can buy it for uh, 10 bucks. You can rent it for five. And for Hanukkah, it's a great Hanukkah experience. Well, I was I was literally about to ask you, um, even though we've been promoting the movie, obviously, but you know, what is your um, if you had a pitch for someone who may not have seen the Hebrew Hammer, who would be curious, who can watch the content, you know, why why should someone who hasn't seen your film watch the Hebrew Hammer for for the holidays? Because it's a very 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 funny and empowering Jewish film. How's that? But no, because it's really 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 funny. Nope, that sounds that sounds perfect. So we'll make sure to put your link at the bottom for the for the merch. And uh, honestly, Jonathan, it's so great to have had you. Appreciate you being on the show. Thank you for having me. No, thank you. No, nope, absolutely. And uh, anyone, please check out the Hebrew Hammer. And uh, for those who are watching, please stay safe, stay healthy, of course. Uh, Jonathan, again, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. All right.